Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the May 19th COVID-19 virtual news conference. My name is Mariah Miracle, and I'm a public information officer working in the Humboldt County Joint Information Center. Let's start by introducing this week's panelists. Operations Chief in the Emergency Operations Center, Sophia Pereira. Humboldt State University Director of Risk Management and Safety Services, who's also serving as Emergency Management Coordinator at the University, Chris Cozera, and County Health Officer, Dr. Ian Hoffman. Uh, so first, I'll provide a brief overview from the Joint Information Center before we hear from our panelists. Uh, since the first case of COVID-19 was diagnosed on February 20th of 2020, a total of 4,152 county residents have tested positive for the virus. 177 people have been hospitalized, and 42 members of our community have died with COVID-19. Based on yesterday's update from the California Department of Public Health, the county's adjusted case rate is 9 per 100,000 residents, and the positive, positivity rate, excuse me, is 4.2%. As was mentioned in yesterday's daily news release, only three California counties uh, fared worse than Humboldt in terms of case rate. Those were Del Norte, Siskiyou, and Yuba counties, and only Siskiyou and Yuba had a higher positivity rate. The JIC call center launched three weeks after the county diagnosed its first case. And in that time, the JIC has responded to more than 48,000 calls and emails, and we're always ready for more. Uh, we invite anyone with questions related to COVID-19 safety measures, testing, or vaccination to give us a call at 707-441-5000. Um, you can also call 441-5000 to speak confidentially with a public health nurse. All right, each participant will now give a brief update on what they've been working on in relation to COVID-19 uh, before taking questions from reporters. Let's start with an update from Ops Chief Sophia Pereira. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, last week, our mobile team vaccinated residents at various nursing homes, and we held a community clinic in Samoa and vaccinated about 100 residents. And so we were just really grateful for the great showing that we saw uh, last week in Samoa. This week, we are running several second dose clinics at the Arcata Community Center, and this is uh, really wrapping up uh, our mass vaccination era that we've been in. Uh, we are also doing second doses this Saturday at Fortuna High. And while our staff and volunteers are dedicated to completing second doses this week, we are holding a first dose Pfizer clinic tomorrow, Thursday, May 20th at College of the Redwoods. This is going to be our first clinic that public health is offering that will be open to ages 12 plus. Uh, we also added a small Johnson & Johnson clinic to run concurrently this Friday at the Arcata Community Center with our second dose clinic that we are holding. And there are still some appointments available for both uh, tomorrow's Pfizer clinic and uh, Friday's uh, Johnson & Johnson uh, clinic. So if you are interested in getting registered or know someone uh, that would be, uh, you can find our clinics at myturn.ca.gov or go to vaccines.gov to find appointments through our pharmacies locally as well. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sophia. Uh, Chris, can you share an update? Yeah, thank you for having me. So Humboldt State just finished off our spring semester. And last weekend, we had 1,100 graduates uh, go through commencement. Each graduate had the opportunity to invite up to two guests. So that was over the course of Friday and Saturday of this past weekend. We had four separate ceremonies. Um, it was highly, it was, it, it, it was very successful. We had everybody masked. Everybody was very appreciative of being able to do something in person. So we're pretty thrilled with how that event has gone. And uh, we are gearing up for repopulation of campus over the course of the summer. We'll start to bring more of our staff and faculty back onto campus in, pre in preparation of having a larger percentage of our courses being offered in person come fall semester and being able to start uh, opening up some of our more student facing activities, including rec sports and some of our club activities. So we're very excited to get moving on that and moving forward with that. Great, thanks very much, Chris. Uh, Dr. Hoffman. Thanks, Mariah. Thanks everyone for being here today. Um, thank you, Chris, for being here and for all the cooperation between HSU and public health uh, throughout the pandemic, um, you know, working together with Chris and the ops team over there, the emergency uh, 
preparedness team has been um, really great uh, experience for us here at Public Health, um, working around the commencement uh, to keep it COVID safe, uh, working around reopening plans for next year. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's great. Those kind of partnerships that we really appreciate in public health. Um, COVID update for uh, this week is really um, focused around what should we expect in the next few months? Uh, we've all seen that since around the beginning of April, we're seeing a resurgence of COVID in Humboldt County. Um, we know that that's due to the UK variant that uh, had not previously been here. Uh, and it's also uh, due to the unvaccinated population that we have still left, those who haven't been vaccinated, um, as well as uh, reopening. And all of those, those things are things to, to think about as we move into uh, June and July. And so I want to just focus on what, what should we expect in the next couple of months. Um, so one thing is uh, around masking, and we know, know that CDC last week came out with uh, some new masking guidance. Um, that masking guidance is supported by science and data and evidence uh, and uh, says that people who are fully vaccinated can go um, without a mask in, in basically any scenario. And, uh, you know, I, I think the science is clear that, that the vaccine works that well. The policy, however, needs some time to be created to make a space safe for vaccinated and unvaccinated people to be together. So that's what California is working on towards June 15th as we keep the current masking guidance in place and work out what will masking guidance look like after June 15th. Uh, we know that it'll align much more closely with the CDC uh, than it does currently. And so that's, that's what we're um, you know, looking toward that, that future and how it's gonna look when we um, can make those recommendations more broadly. And so we'll keep preparing everyone for that. Um, but I think most people should be prepared that uh, what you're seeing from the CDC right now is what we will likely see uh, the recommendations be from uh, California and from Humboldt County Public Health. Um, we also know that the blueprint is going to uh, retire or most of it will, so we won't see the restrictions on businesses. Uh, we won't see the restrictions on capacity that we've had um, in place over the, the course of the pandemic. So, um, you know, preparing for those sorts of things and having businesses think about what kinds of limits do they want to let go of and which ones do they want to keep. Um, you know, we fully suspect that some businesses will not feel comfortable going back to pre-pandemic uh, operations, uh, both in masking and around their capacity limits. So that'll be really up to each individual business. Um, but from the standpoint of public health, those recommendations might stand, but they will not be requirements any longer. Um, we know that the, uh, there will be some limitations on very large events. Uh, and so we're hoping to get some, some more details on that in the coming weeks as we approach June 15th. Um, but these are gonna be events in the many thousands of people and what those sorts of restrictions look like um, are still being worked out right now at the state level. Um, want to make sure that I uh, want to give some updates on what we think is likely to happen in the course of the next few months as well with cases. Given that we've seen this rise in cases, um, as Mariah said, we um, have one of the highest case rates in the, in the state right now. Um, and it's looking like that is probably going to continue uh, into the next several months. Uh, and the reasoning for that is a combination of a couple of things, a, a slowdown in our vaccination effort. So we are you know, upwards around 60% of people who are eligible have one shot, um, but that certainly leaves a large proportion of the population who are still uh, unprotected and can become infected with the, the virus. Um, so, so that's one factor. Another factor is uh, are the changing protections that have been in place throughout the entire pandemic um, going away and continuing to go away even more so come June 15th. Um, so uh, we expect that taking away some of those will, will, 
likely continue to fuel um, the movement of the virus. And then there's the variants, the variants of concern. Um, UK variant moved in very quickly. Um, there are other variants that are very close by. We have a few P1 variants, a few other counties have much higher proportions. Um, and it's really just going to be a case of which variant compete, outcompetes the other. Um, and it's looking like the Indian variant is also likely to um, make its way into the United States and potentially become another um, variant that is uh, impacting our area. So we'll keep an eye on all of that. Um, but given all of those scenarios, all of those factors, we're suspecting that cases might not peak until sometime around middle of July, uh, sometime in the middle of the summer. Um, so that leaves us with what do we have left? And that's really vaccination. Um, so really wanna encourage everyone to utilize the next month to get vaccinated. Um, we have lots of opportunities. As Sophia mentioned, our public health clinics, which are listed on my turn. Um, if you're not finding a clinic there that works for you um, because of location or the kind of vaccine or your age, uh, then please go to vaccines.gov, look and see which uh, pharmacies are listed. Um, many of those pharmacies are now doing 12 year olds and up. Um, so uh, I just, you know, do what you can to get the vaccine. Uh, and that's going to be one of our last protections. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Hoffman, and thanks to all of you. Um, now we'll take questions from reporters, and we'll start with Iridian from the North Coast Journal. Hi there. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, my question is just with the expectation of cases continuing to rise, um, would the county impose any other additional mitigation me measures um, for reopening by June 15th, or our vaccinations kind of the only tool that will will be used to control the virus's spread come June 15. Yeah, great question. Um, so the restrictions that we had in place were really to protect um, both a, an unvaccinated population and to protect our hospitals, um, which were, you know, we saw the overwhelming surges uh, crushing the capacity of the ICUs of um, you know, shutting down entire cities, hospital system. So um, we're, we're past that. I, I think, you know, we're running a very high capacity in the hospitals right now in Humboldt County for um, both COVID and non-COVID um, reasons. Um, so, you know, if, if it was looking like our hospitals were unable to meet the capacity, then it might be something where we would have to look at more restrictions. Um, but we're pretty far away from that. We never really got to any point in the pandemic where um, our hospital system was so overstressed. Um, so I, I think it's highly unlikely that we would need to resort to those kinds of measures again. Um, so it's really about uh, vaccination at this point and just gearing up and preparing, knowing what we're looking at come June 15th. Any follow-ups on that, Iridian? Uh, no follow-ups to that question. Okay, thank you. Do any other reporters have questions about that June 15th transition, the ending of the blueprint or anything like that? Uh, yes. Okay, okay. Uh, let's start. Uh, Isabella, and then we'll get your question, Taylor. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so kind of dovetailing off what Iridian had asked, um, so since the state has decided to keep the masking guidelines in place until the state's reopening on June 15th, you know, I've heard comments from community members essentially saying, you know, the CDC overrides the California Department of Public Health or local public health and no longer feel masking is necessary. So um, how does public health respond to people who have that belief and what will enforcement be like for those folks leading up to June 15th? Yeah, that's another great question. Um, so California uh, does make its own policy in regards to public health. And uh, CDC actually doesn't set any policy guidance. They, um, they offer guidelines. And so that's what their, their recent recommendation was. It was a guidance, but it's up to each state to set their own policy um, unless there's a federal policy put down from uh, you know, the legislature or from the president's office. So 
Um, CDC is guidance. Um, CDPH and the governor's uh, policy are the law in California. So, um, you know, I think as far as enforcement, um, you know, we've we've been at this a long time and we haven't really had to go a route of, you know, true enforcement. It's really an educational um, campaign. I think, um, you know, most businesses have been very willing to, um, you know, go down the road of um, following the guidelines because they want people to feel safe in their establishments. Um, so I, I think that's where we're at and that's where, where, where we've been and that's what it'll be like until we get to the next level of this come June 15th um, when we have the ability to figure out how to put policy in a place where some people are going to be asked to be masked and some are asked to are allowed not to mask. Um, so, you know, anyone who uh, I, I think we, we know all along there have been people who haven't worn masks, who haven't followed the guidance, and I don't uh, suspect that this will change their mind too much. Sure, thank you, Dr. Hoffman. And I mean, very similarly, but quickly, um, you know, what is, what is public health's advice to business owners who are, you know, concerned for their safety or their employee safety when it comes to removing masks after uh, the June 15th reopening? <laughs> Well, my number one advice would be get vaccinated before uh, June 15th because it's your number one tool. It's the best tool we have. Um, when we look at the uh, protection that it offers, it's extraordinarily strong. And I, I, don't, uh, I don't recommend lightly that a vaccinated person can go without a mask in public. I think that's um, a true testament to how good this vaccine is. Um, I think there will still be workplace regulations. We have to um, remember that Cal OSHA regulates workplaces. And so Cal OSHA um, currently does not allow for unmasked folks in uh, a work environment out other than in their private office. So, um, so being unmasked in a work environment is still not allowed. And Cal OSHA is meeting tomorrow uh, to revise, look at revisions, and we have so we have no idea what those revisions are going to look like. Um, but the current rec the current proposal um, would extend some of these things past June fifteenth as well. Some of the um, the recommended changes around masking on vaccinated and unvaccinated folks, and um, you know the difference with that is that a workplace can verify. Um, if you're vaccinated or not, they can ask you for proof of vaccination. And if you're not, then you would have to wear a mask. So um, those are some of the things that people should be looking at as business owners. Um, and I think also I'll say to a certain degree, we're going to be going back to that era we were in early in the pandemic, right, where certain establishments declared themselves as you're, you have to wear a mask when you come into my establishment. Um, and others will not. And I think that that'll be, a, again, a decision up to each uh, workplace, um, how they want to respond to that um, and how their customers and the public might respond to that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Isabella. Taylor, did you have a question? Yes. So obviously all eyes are on this June 15th date, but is there anything that could possibly derail that plan or is there any chance of restri restrictions sticking around a little longer, either at the state level or here locally? Yeah, I, I think, you know, the numbers statewide look really good. So I don't see a likelihood for that. You know, of course, this in this pandemic, you never want to get um, too um, wedded to any one thing. So um, we'll keep an eye on it. I think for Humboldt County, um, like I said, we're, we're not, you know, based on our uh, epidemiological modeling, uh, looking at the numbers, looking at um, some of the state data, you know, we just don't see the cases likely going down uh, over the next coming months. Um, so I, I, I think the only thing that would likely cause us to have more restrictions in the state would be if we were truly in a position where our hospitals were not able to take care of the patients who are coming in. Great, thank you. That's all I had on that one. Any other follow-up questions about uh, the June 15th transition or the blueprint? I do. 
Um, hi, Ryan Hudson here for the Redheaded Black Belt. Thank you for taking the time, everybody. Um, I'm just interested to know if local businesses need to sort of reapply to the county, submit sort of a revised business plan for that opening date, or is that something we can look forward to? It's a great question, Ryan. I uh, will get back to you on it. I, we're not, not planning on revising it. Um, so my guess is that it's just gonna um, go away or become something voluntary if people uh -huh. wanna go that route, but the, those decisions haven't totally been made yet. Thank you. Any other questions about June 15th? All right, uh, time standard, Isabella? Yes, hello. Um, so Attorney General uh, Rob Bonta sent out a warning about counterfeit COVID vaccination cards today. And I'm wondering if um, we have received any reports of that happening here in Humboldt. I have not. Okay, well, that, uh, that does it for me on that subject then. Thanks, Isabella. Uh, Taylor Elliott, Redwood News. Yeah, so are you, I know that Dr. Hoffman spoke a little bit about breakthrough cases as far as like symptoms and how a lot of people are not symptomatic, but are you able to give an update on the number of local breakthrough cases? Uh, we're, we're not really tracking them. Uh, there's, there's a lot of numbers swirling around out there and um, you know, the, the state is tracking them. Uh, so I did report on the statewide numbers recently and um, this, the CDC is also tracking that nationally. Um, it is a very low number of cases uh, in California as of last week, it was less than 0.026% of, of uh, folks who are fully vaccinated had a positive test and um, the vast majority of those were asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic, like a cold. So I think, you know, the, the point with these breakthrough cases is that they are expected. This vaccine, um, you know, it was never uh, going to be 100 percent, um, but it moves coronavirus, uh, COVID-19 disease from being a deadly disease that is almost 10 times more deadly than influenza to being a mild cold. And that's, that's what we know. Great, thank you. Thank you, Taylor. Uh, any follow-up questions on that? Uh, breakthrough cases. Seeing none, uh, Michael from North Coast News. Yes, hi. Um, so I have a question kind of related to um, the vaccination effort. We know that's very important right now. Um, I, I've seen through other CSU campuses within the system that, um, like, for example, at Cal State Fullerton, they've hosted uh, vaccine clinics on campus to try and get more students and their families vaccinated um, ahead of the school year because we know students need to be vaccinated to be on campus. Um, have there been any considerations to host um, any kind of clinic on the HSU campus? And if, if so, um, why is that not being considered? So Humboldt State actually did host a series of clinics uh, early on in the process, I believe, Ian, correct me if I'm wrong, around April is when we started. So when the high, when educators group went, uh, we opened it up to our staff and faculty on campus through our student health center with the support of the county. Uh, we were able to get all of the staff and faculty who opted into receiving vaccines taken care of. And then we moved slightly into um, vaccinating some of our high risk student population. However, we came up to the end of the semester and our student health center closing. So we've taken a pause on that. We've been doing a pretty aggressive campaign with trying to help our student population specifically 
find in not just our community, many of our students are in communities throughout the state and the country, uh, places to seek vaccinations. And then come fall, we're working on what that may look like. We do have a partnership lined up with Safeway to potentially run additional clinics on campus. So. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, I, I would add to that. Yeah, we had a great partnership with HSU early on uh, in the vaccine effort to prepare for getting the educators. And um, so they signed up to become a COVID-19 uh, vaccine vaccination uh, site and, um, you know, took care of all their own staff, um, both the educators and the, the rest of the staff and housing and grounds crews and everything down to, you know, the uh, maintenance staffs. Um, and, and they have uh, offered smaller vaccine clinics to the students. But um, like Chris said, when we were getting to the point of opening up eligibility more broadly, it was getting to the end of the year. And so um, a lot of the students had access through clinics that were already um, a few blocks away. I mean, our Cata Community Center is our biggest mass vac site, and it's just a few blocks off campus. So um, uh, we encouraged people to go there. We, uh, Chris and, and her team sent out communications about the, that, to let people know. And uh, I know as recently as um, last week, we're, we're communicating about the Samoa uh, clinic and figure out, may, can we get some students out there to the Samoa clinic who um, needed last minute vaccines? So we've been working really closely together. And I think even though we haven't had a mass vac site on campus, having one um, about five, six blocks away was, was pretty good for most of the month of um, April and May. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Any other questions about uh, vaccinating students? Uh, Ryan from the Redheaded Black Belt, thanks for joining us. Do you have any additional questions, Ryan? Yes, sorry about that. I was nope. muted. No problem. Um, <laughs> thank you. So we've been watching the numbers of people getting the COVID test go down recently. Um, we've also heard that the community is being urged to continue getting the COVID test to bring these numbers up again. And meanwhile, uh, Dr. Fauci has said that there's not a need for asymptomatic vaccinated people to get tested. So many of us who were routinely getting tested for work or other reasons just on a regular basis are no longer doing that, getting that regular COVID test. So um, taking that into consideration, what is the county's preference for testing among asymptomatic vaccinated individuals locally and um, the same recommended by the CDC or should we still be routinely tested? Uh, yeah, thanks, Ryan. Um, we would not recommend someone who's fully vaccinated and asymptomatic to continue testing unless you're required to by uh, work. There are some settings where people are still required. Um, we're working on uh, updating some of those guidelines like in healthcare um, around fully vaccinated um, as well as like I mentioned the Cal OSHA regulations that are going to be coming out tomorrow um, you know in terms of also um, quarantining in the workplace because the, the regulations are different through Cal OSHA than they are through the um, county or state. So um, for personal reasons, and again, if you're not required to from a work standpoint, mm -hmm. fully agree. Fully vaccinated, asymptomatic, not exposed to someone and not having any symptoms, you, you do not need to test anymore. Um, that is one of the great benefits of being fully vaccinated. Um, you know, and I would also add that even if you get exposed to someone with known COVID-19, you don't have to quarantine if you are fully vaccinated. You can self-monitor uh, for symptoms. And, in, and then if you get symptoms, you should, um, you, know, you, you should test because there are a few cases of people, like we've said, getting COVID after the vaccine, after being fully vaccinated, but they have much more mild symptoms. And we're still working out how likely they are to spread it to someone else. We think it's very, very unlikely though. 
but some of that data is still coming in and we'll have more reassurance, I'm sure in the coming weeks or months around, um, you know, feeling even more confident that if you are fully vaccinated, you test positive that you couldn't pack, continue to pass this along to someone else. Mm -hmm. Okay. I do have a quick follow up on that. Um, so is the reduction in vaccinated asymptomatic tests statistically significant? And if it is significant, statistically speaking, um, how does that figure into the decision to put us into a more or less restrictive tier? Any, I guess you're asking about test positivity rate and if we're um, testing less of the population who's vaccinated. Um, yeah, I, right now, again, I, the only thing that's gonna put us into more restrictive areas is our hospital capacity. So I think you know we're tracking the positivity rate, we're tracking the case rate uh, because it's important from an epidemiologic standpoint for us to know where things are headed in the county. Um, but as in terms of policy making and decisions around, um, do we need to get more restrictive? Th those decisions are really going to be made around hospital capacity and ability to take care of those who are sick in our community. So it it might have a small impact on increasing the um, test positivity rate, and I, I, it's been brought up to CDPH around that issue, and I know they're looking at it. Um, you know, should there be some adjustment, but they, um, they already did adjust it, you know, with the blueprint changes that happened um, last month with, you know, the adjustment to the case rates and adjustments to the test positivity cutoffs for the different tiers. So um, to a certain degree that, that adjustment was already made um, and they, there might be more adjustments. Um, although at this point with the blueprint retiring in um, less than a month, uh, I think um, it's probably not going to happen. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Any uh, follow up questions on uh, guidance for fully vaccinated individuals or testing uh, more broadly? All right, thank you all. Um, we've got a little bit of time here. So we'll um, go back through uh, Iridian from the North Coast Journal. Do you have any additional questions? Um, yeah, I have one question. I was wondering um, if public health has any tools that could help uh, combat with vaccine hesitancy. Well, I think there's a lot of uh, things out there that uh, we're calling vaccine hesitancy. So the first thing is just understanding where we're at. Um, the first the first tool that we're using is really trying to break down barriers because there are people who want the vaccine, who are willing to get the vaccine, uh, but it's, it's, you know, they have some sort of barrier to get it. They um, don't have enough money to pay for the gas to get to a vaccination site. They can't take off of work. They don't have someone to watch their kids. Um, whatever that barrier is, those people are, are very high on our list and we're trying to work on, on breaking down those barriers, um, looking at lots of different ways. Um, one way is through the use of my turn, which does have the ability to have people identify themselves as having transportation and uh, uh, transportation barriers or being homebound, um, which is another thing that, uh, you know, there are a significant number of people who you know, just for medical or other reasons can't leave their home. So we're working on those. Um, I think the, the next level of, uh, of sort of hesitancy is, is really around um, knowledge. And there's people who um, just don't feel like they know enough. They don't feel like they can feel confident that the vaccine is the right thing for them. Uh, some of those people will be uh, educated through the media um, through what they hear on the news or read in the newspaper. Others will be educated through people they talk to. So I think the more that all of us can talk about the vaccine, if we're vaccinated, talk about, um, you know, how, what it was like for us, um, encourage people to get vaccinated as well, um, encourage them to, to take up the full benefits of being fully vaccinated. Um, 
And if there are medical concerns, to have them talk to their, their medical provider. Um, that, that's you know another thing about this particular vaccine is that it's not being given in its traditional, uh, the place that we would traditionally get vaccinated. It's not being given in medical offices. So, so people aren't going to their trusted medical source to get it. Um, so I think that's been a bit of, of uh, a barrier leading to some hesitancy. Um, and then there are folks who firmly believe that this is not a vaccine that they want to get. And, um, you know, I think for those folks, um, we just want to stay open minded and, uh, you know, offer them, uh, you know, compassion and empathy. And if, if they change their mind, we want to be there available for them um, when they do want to get vaccinated. Great, thank you so much. Thanks, Viridian. Any follow up questions on that? Uh, no, I don't. I would... Hi, sorry. I would like to ask um, regarding the hesitancy issues and you know lack of mobility or access. Um, Humboldt has so many remote corners and, and areas. Um, can you just give us an update on how it's going, sort of getting into the nooks and crannies and to the more remote places? Yeah, I can, I can speak to that. So uh, we have a team that one is focused on doing outreach throughout the county. So making sure that we're connecting with local community leaders, community organizations that can really give us that on the ground perspective of how we can best, uh, you know, reach uh, those that are hard to reach. Uh, so we are, we're doing that. Um, so we, we've been out uh, to you know, Rio Dell, we've been out to Petrolia, uh, we were in Samoa. Uh, we are we are taking a data informed approach as well, looking at um, the Healthy Places Index and other data vaccination rates to help guide uh, where we want to prioritize. Uh, we also are uh, vaccinating uh, in nursing homes and other um, congregate housing settings to make sure. Um, that we're reducing the likelihood of spread in those um, those facilities as well um, as new residents may be going into those facilities. So uh, we're, we're looking at where are the communities uh, that, that have a high need or may need some extra attention. And if we've gone to a community once, it doesn't preclude us from going back. Uh, so there may be communities that we've been to already that we're planning to go back to again to make sure that we, we reach more folks. Uh, so this is going to be something we're going to be doing um, over the next several months, um, but it's uh, something that we're committed to. And so we're not going to see those high mass vaccination numbers, but it's going to be doing that groundwork to make sure we're reaching those that need it most. Thank you. Thanks, Sophia. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, Isabella from the Time Standard. Any additional questions? Yeah, uh, I apologize. I would actually like to go back to the June 15th reopening. And um, something that Michelle Stevens had said during yesterday's address to supervisors, um, I know that JIC's operations will change after June 15th, but um, I'm wondering what that will actually look like um, if Dr. Hoffman or someone can elaborate more so on that. And also how the county will continue to provide updates on COVID cases, hospitalizations, and deaths after June 15th. Is this something I can just maybe speak to the transition uh, for the emergency operations center? So, um, you know, public health and the joint information center are still going to be running. Uh, you know, if things may be scaling down in certain areas, there's still going to be those those core functions. So, just like we're going to be continuing to do mobile vaccination, uh, the joint information center and uh, will we'll still be an important part of our operation. Um, so I, I don't see any major changes happening on that front. Some things may be scaling down as some needs uh, may, may decline, uh, but, but overall there's still gonna be some core functions that we'll be doing in the emergency response. Thank you. And Isabella, we'll make sure to uh, provide those details to local news outlets um, if there's any change in that process or what sure, to expect. Thank you. Uh, I'm I will add to that, um, you know, we, this is not necessarily a complete scale down of the public health operation of COVID response, because as we have mentioned, you know, we're, 
we're still looking at cases probably at this level well into the summertime. Um, this is also a uh, pre preparation for wildfire season in our area, which is, as we all know, um, likely to be one of the worst seasons yet, given the drought conditions across the state and what we've seen over the last few years. So um, there's there are a lot of uh, different uh, reasons that this is happening, and that is also one of them. But I agree with Sophia. It's, you're not going to see much of a change. It's more of a moving of some folks around to free them up for other needs. And, and, and a lot of that's been going on behind the scenes in, in smaller ways throughout the whole pandemic as we scale up one part, scale it back, scale up another part. So, so investigations or vaccine and just responding to where we need to have folks on, on this emergency response. Definitely, thank you for touching on that. Thanks, Isabella. Uh, Taylor from Redwood News. Um, so going back a little bit to vaccine access and getting into the more rural areas, I know that I believe it was last week at the news conference, um, Lindsay Mendez had mentioned that there was an option now on my turn for homebound individuals. And I was just wondering if you could provide an update on kind of how that's going and if the county has actually started vaccinating homebound individuals. Great question. I'm so glad you brought it up. Uh, next week is actually the first week that we'll we'll be launching our mobile team to do um, home, homebound outreach. So uh, we, we've already been connecting with folks that have either signed up through people who maybe contacted the Joint Information Center um, if they weren't aware of the My Turn feature. And then we also did uh, get a list from the state as well um, from people who signed up through My Turn. So, that is something that uh, we are starting uh, early next week, and we will be continuing to do that as uh, folks uh, communicate to us that need, either through my turn or through the Joint Information Center. Um, but the my turn option is um, definitely a way that the state um, can track that and do some follow up and do some vetting, making sure that um, whether it's that are homebound or need transportation uh, benefits or assistance of some kind, uh, my turn uh, is a good place to start with that. Or, or they can call uh, the Joint Information Center if they're homebound for mobility or medical reasons and get that to the right person on our team and then we'll follow up. Great, thank you. Thank you, Taylor. Uh, Michael from North Coast News. Yeah, so I was looking to see if I could just get some clarification from something I heard kind of early on in the conference. I, I heard I, uh, that public health is kind of wrapping up this mass vaccination era. Um, I was just trying to get, see if I get some clarification on what exactly that means. And if, if we still have so many people who aren't vaccinated, why are we moving away from that practice? Michael, thanks for that question. Uh, so that's a term that's that's used in public health and emergency response to describe like a, a static site that is doing high volume in a particular day. So mass vaccination could range from doing 800 to 1200 to what you see in you know at the Oakland Coliseum where they're doing thousands in a day. Um, the most we've done at one of our mass vaccination sites is 1200. Uh, so that's a really high volume uh, for a small county that we have. So that era, so to speak, of doing mass vaccination where you have a static site where you're doing very high volume in one particular place um, is not going to meet the needs of this community long term as we see that there's needs in Petrolia, there's needs in Honeydew, there's needs uh, in Orleans. Like we need to make sure that we're reaching those that can't make it to a mass vaccination site for whatever reason. So uh, we're not going to be seeing that high volume of doing 1200 in a day because we, we now are going to be focusing on reaching uh, the smaller, more remote communities um, in Humboldt County. And I also point out that this is driven by demand. So we once we noticed that the demand for the mass vaccination sites was dropping, we responded by offering less appointments there because there's no reason to offer a thousand appointments when three or 400 fill. So we offer the number of appointments that are needed if, if we fill those up rapidly, we expand those clinics and offer more, um, you know, because we want, the, we want the staff who are working to be doing, uh, you know, to be able to vaccinate as many people as possible. So freeing those folks up who can now work on mobile clinics. Um, another factor that goes into this uh, is that um, there's 
you know, when we started doing mass vaccination clinics um, at CR and Arcadia Community Center, there were only a few spots outside of the um, medical providers who were mostly just doing their own patients. Uh, and, and there were just a few pharmacies who were doing uh, vaccination through the Federal Pharmacy Partnership. There are now dozens of pharmacies around, uh, or around a dozen, I should say, not dozens, about a dozen pharmacies that are doing vaccinations in Humboldt County currently um, from McKinleyville all the way down to Fortuna. So there are a lot more opportunities for people. And those have gone from having wait times of weeks to, to a month or more for an appointment to same day or tomorrow you can get an appointment. So the availability of the vaccine is much more widespread. And so we're shifting away from mass vaccination so that we can focus on getting into those um, I think it was Ryan who said nooks and crannies of Humboldt County. We know the nooks and crannies. We know the places we need to go. We need to free up our staff to get to get there and and make the connection so that when we go there, it has the highest impact possible. Um, and that's what we've seen so far, like in Rio Dell, we saw it in Samoa um, and there are in Petrolia and there are more to come uh, in the coming weeks. So that's our shift when we say trend transitioning from mass facts to, you know, this more mobile clinic uh, approach. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Ryan from the Redheaded Black Belts, do you have any additional questions? Um, I suppose I'm curious, my only additional question is that I'm curious about um progress with the latino latinx community getting vaccinated and um, outreach to them if there's progress there i'd love to know you know i i think that we have seen progress I and mean, we've seen that group continue to increase the number of vaccinations steadily over the past month and a half um, we were able to get bilingual folks into all of our clinics, um, get information out there, hold, uh, hold, held a clinic in Fortuna um, three weeks ago, um, having that second follow-up clinic this weekend um, that was you know, designed to be in a community close by to a community that um, uh, is Spanish speaking and ma making it accessible for Spanish speakers promoting it through Spanish speaking channels. Um, you know, we went to businesses that had primarily Spanish speakers. Um, so we haven't quite seen that gap close yet though between the percentage of the population. Um, so I think there is still work to be done and that's part of the mobile vac vaccination effort and part of what we need to focus on in the coming uh, weeks and months as we continue to get, try to get the vaccine out there as far and wide as possible and figure out what those barriers are for, for, um, for everyone left who you know, is not truly hesitant because I do firmly believe there are many people out there who are, um, have barriers of some sort that still need to be overcome, be the, the transportation, financial, knowledge barriers um, and really breaking those down. Thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much to all of our reporters for uh, joining us today. Um, I'd just like to ask the panelists uh, if they had any closing thoughts they wanted to share, um, or if you wanted to answer uh, just from your perspective, now that more and more of our community is fully vaccinated, is there, um, you know, what, what can you do now um, that you couldn't do before, either because um, it wasn't allowed or uh, because it just did not uh, feel safe? Uh, let's start with uh, Sophia. Sure, I'll, I'll just say that uh, now that my family's vaccinated um, and folks in the community are vaccinated, I'm the new mom of a nine month old and it really gives me some peace of mind uh, knowing that more people in our community are vaccinated and that has meant that he's been able to meet some of his family uh, that he didn't get to meet early on in this pandemic. Thanks very much, Sophia. Chris? Yeah, um, we're getting really excited over at Humboldt State to be able to bring more students back onto campus and see some of that liveliness and activity start to 
occur again. It's been a year of, of very minimal footprints of students on campus. And um, it definitely changes the energy level and the vibe on campus. And so we are very much looking forward to moving into fall semester where we should have a significant increase in our students on campus and, and bringing some of that energy and life back to campus. Uh, I think we, we've been waiting for that. <laughs> Thanks very much, Chris. Dr. Hoffman? Yeah, it's, uh, it's really been great in the last um, few weeks to uh, feel confident to you know, hang out with friends and family that we haven't seen in well over a year and um, give them hugs and, uh, you know, have my kids see family and friends who they haven't been able to be around for um, the last year. So it, it's changed a lot in the last um, little bit. Um, also, just being able to walk outside without a mask on is, is great. I, I think um, I feel fully confident in the vaccine and um, so walking down the street, walking around public places without a mask on, um, completely safe if you're fully vaccinated. I think there's, there's no reason to be um, concerned any longer. So um, I hope that others decide to, uh, to get vaccinated and protect themselves, protect their family and protect their community. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hoffman. And thanks to uh, you, Chris and Sophia. And thank you to our media representatives for joining us today. Um, we'll provide a recording as soon as possible. Have a great day.